can just uh, can, can you help me? So I, I should I should be able. Look, it. Uh, you just have to switch the the, the camera, which is this black guy here. Mm -hmm. So up to three, so that uh, the screen uh, the beamer is is shown, and then four is black to the back. Okay. So it's three and four. Okay. Okay. And you just tell me when I... Yes, yes, then I will just switch to three. We will yes. do it with the beamer and then back to four. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. <sighs> okay, we managed. Okay, so I will start with... Uh, uh, a brief uh, overview of what we did so far, which is quite a lot because we went through electrodynamics and we started to actually even earlier to study the behavior of uh, neutral particles. We defined the Minkowski space and we've seen all the magic that are related to this Minkowski space such as the weird properties of uh, summation of velocities, transformation of angles, of times, of length, and so on and so forth. Whenever we change the, um, the, the rest frame with respect to the observer that we are using. And as I said, the rest frame, so we are only dealing with uh, frames that are moving with a constant velocity. Okay, there are no accelerations in the frames involved. The particles can accelerate in a frame, but the frame with respect to which we are performing our observation are uh, inertial, so they're moving with a constant velocity. Inertial frames, and we have seen that the relation between two frames, whenever we make the transformation of the coordinates, and now R4, and a four-dimensional vector space, are given by the Lorentz transform. We have seen that a particle, if it is neutral, is characterized by a mass, and then a fourth position, where the fourth position, we know, is x, y, z, and time, and x mu, the vector, belong to the Minkowski space. Can you please check the... Sorry, you need to be checked. Uh, we need to check your certificate. If some of you can uh, just look at your cell phone, thanks. Okay. That's the particle. So we have seen all the transformations that are uh, basically related to this part, transformation of space of time that cannot anymore be disentangled. They are playing together. They are belonging to the same vector, to the same mathematical object. Then what we did, we studied the uh, behaviors of this particle and the mechanics of this particle. Relativistic mechanics, where we basically studied the four velocity, u mu, that is just a definition, so is the dx mu over the tau where the tau is the proper time, is the prime, that is, that is the time that is going, flowing with, the, uh, with its own uh, frame, last frame. Then we have seen the, the four acceleration, a mu, which is just uh, defined in the similar way, is just the u mu over the tau. And then we have seen how this is also related, you know, we have acceleration, we can relate it to a four force, which we have, we, I think I use g, uh, we define the four force G mu, in which the, in which the, uh, we, we've seen the relation between the, the work and the change in momentum, so the, the standard three-dimensional force that is uh, uh, applied to particles. After that, we uh, start to add complication, so it is good for a neutral particle, we included a charge. And now it has an additional properties, which is Q, can be positive or negative. It has a mass, and again, it has a fourth position in our Minkowski space. 
attached to these uh, particles, we have basically uh, uh, defined oh, well, another imp very important quantity that is associated to uh, two particles is the four momentum, P mu, which is defined as M mu mu. Okay? So we have seen that the first component, the time component, the zeroth component, belongs, describes the energy of our particle, whereas the other three components, one, two, and three, so the spatial component, spatial component, describes, uh, are related to the standard three-dimensional momentum uh, of, uh, of our particles. Okay, good. So we have seen that. Then what we did was to uh, basically start to uh, work out uh, the uh, dynamics of such a charged particle in the context of a fixed Ele uh, electromagnetic field. It we've seen to be characterized through a four potential, which was our A mu, which we define as a scalar potential plus a three-dimensional vector potential field. Through that, the electromagnetic field that we've seen is not we don't have anymore an electric and a magnetic field apart as two independent elements, but we have one mathematical object, which is the energy momentum tensor, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the electromagnetic uh, tensor, P mu mu, which is an antisymmetric object, as we've seen. The, um, the So we have mu uh, A nu minus the nu A mu. So you see it's anti-symmetric, and that's because uh, uh, a, more comp an, um, a tensor with more components is not required because it has too many components. Because in this electromagnetic tensor, we need to contain our necessary degrees of freedom, which are three for the electric field, and uh, three for the magnetic one. So that's why, remember, we needed, uh, I mean, it's sufficient, the smallest mathematical object okay, that can contain the necessary degrees of freedom is given by an anti-symmetric tensor. That we see can be uniquely defined once we specify uh, our four potential. Okay? That's our construction. And this guy here was actually popping out of the equations whenever we applied the least action principle applied to a, the action of a particle in which we had the terms of the inertial motion of our particle, like a free particle, plus the interaction between the uh, electric, uh, um, the electromagnetic field and the charged particle. So in the Lagrangian, we have these two components by what is so that's, uh, this, that's the minimization of the action by imposing the fact that the action must be minimal, so least action principle that tell us what is the dynamics, that tell us what is the equation of motion of our charged particle in presence of a static electric field. We basically so uh, we derived actually the Lorentz force. And then the work that is um, uh, applied that is uh, applied to a particle, or I don't know how to say the interaction between a particle and the, and the, I mean the work which is associated with this electromagnetic field between the interaction of this electromagnetic field and our charged particle. And we've seen that basically we have a force, which is a fo uh, we, we derive basically the four force that contains work zero component and the Lorentz. Uh, uh, force of our electromagnetic particle that have a dependency on the magnetic field and on the electric field. Okay? And we have seen that the component of the Lorentz force of the magnetic field doesn't uh, produce any work because the acceleration produced by this force is orthogonal to the velocity of our particle. Therefore, what, what our particle is going to do is just to change trajectory. Okay? And this is if, as a result, no work, zero work. Can you please and anybody just check? Thank you. 
Okay, whereas the electric field, which has a component uh, E vector E, so it's directly proportional to E, and it gives uh, an acceleration to the particle, therefore work is applied to our particle. Okay? You see, that's, that's a lot of stuff, just coming from the simple consideration by starting to look at the uh, existence, or let's say the formulation of the space-time in terms of the Minkowski metric. Look what is the uh, equation of motion that is uh, defined through the least action principle with the Lagrangian in which we have uh, the interaction of our charged particle and the, electri and, uh, and the electromagnetic field. And we end up in discovering that the magnetic and the electric field belong to one individual uh, mathematical object, which is the, which is, uh, is uh, F union. Okay? And look, as I said, fixed, because we know that uh, the charge is producing an electric magnetic field itself, and therefore is radiating, is producing, is in the total in, uh, electromagnetic field is going to be given by the one that is existing plus the one produced by the electric field. And therefore, the presence of the particle is affecting the electromagnetic field. In this computation, this was ignored, okay? Because we assume in this derivation that A nu is fixed. We used our particle as a test particle to probe the nature of the electromagnetic field. That's what we did. Because we were also aiming at a linear theory because that's what uh, electrodynamic is, is a linear theory. We need to arrive in the end at the Maxwell's equation. Then what we did, we derived, uh, we related our Lagrangian to to uh, uh, something that is related to the energy and the energy fluxes and the momentum flux of our system, namely the uh, energy momentum tensor. In general, so it was something very generic that can be applied to any field of physics that you are going to encounter, if you are going to study general relativity, you are going to need an energy momentum tensor that basically sources gravity, as in, the in this case, the energy momentum tensor of the electromagnetic field is responsible for the uh, properties of the electromagnetic field, of course. And we have seen that there are various components, is a rank two tensor, four by four, in which the uh, the, 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 the zero element, zero, zero element, was related to the energy density. Then we have seen that the three components of, uh, um, of, the, of the first line was related to the flux of the energy density. This guy can be made symmetric, therefore also these terms are referring to the energy density. And then we have the fact that these guys, this energy density, can also be related to the momentum. And each of these lines, one, two, and three, refers to the energy density flux of, sorry, of the momentum flux of our system. As I said, we did it specifically for an electromagnetic field, but it's generic. can be also a system that is composed by n particles. And in fact, we are going to use the energy momentum tensor to derive the behavior of fluids with hydrodynamics, where fluids are nothing but a collection of many, many, many particles. Okay? We have seen that in the construction of this en energy momentum density, actually, we constructed it as the thing which is conserved, as the global property of the system, because it's based on the Lagrangian, that contains all information about our system, it is that quantity that is conserved. Energy, momentum, conservation.
And these are four equations. Because again, I stress the fact that we have mu, mu, so we have two repeated indices. We have a free one in which the nu zero component, when nu is equal to zero, expresses energy conservation. And the components nu equal to one, two, and three, so I express it with a Latin index, expresses the momentum conservation. Okay. Once we have that, we have the energy density flux. Therefore, we know what is the, the, flux of, the flux of energy which is associated to our system, in this case an electromagnetic field. We derived the pointing vector, which are these first three elements up here, that are the energy density flux. And then we relate it to the flux of energy which is propagated by our moving charged particle. And we see that a charged particle is uh, producing such a flux, it therefore is emitting radiation, is emitting power, energy, as a unit of time, and therefore power. Only if it is accelerated. This was given by the Larmor formula. Okay, you see the link? So we studied the energy momentum tensor in which we have the energy density flux and the momentum flux. And through the energy density flux, we know what is the flux of energy that is emitted or propagating away from our system, or well, that belongs to our system actually, because it is of the energy momentum tensor of the electromagnetic field, therefore the electromagnetic field possesses this energy density flux. And through the study of this element, we derived the Larmor formula that is going to express the power emitted to, the, uh, to, this, element, uh, to this charged particle through the electromagnetic field, which is nothing but the amount of energy propagating per unit of time, the amount of energy per unit of time. Okay? Then we start to look at consequences of uh, all of this uh, theory that we constructed. For example, we studied the Thompson cross-section. In which we have a free electron. We have an incoming electromagnetic wave. And uh, we know that there is the, well, let's make it, the electric wave come like this, in this direction. We have the electric field, which is uh, much larger, you know, to, with I mean, this is an electron, an incoming electromagnetic wave. Therefore, we have uh, an electric and a magnetic field associated to it. Electric and magnetic field that is going to accelerate our electron, which is a charged particle, through the Lorentz force. We've seen that the that the, um, we see that the uh, amount of force that the electric field is applying with respect to the particle, with respect to the one produced by the magnetic field is much larger, therefore we can simply neglect the magnetic component of the Lorentz force, and the electric field is going to oscill make the, our particle oscillate up and down in this way, therefore we have an acceleration through the Larmor force, we have an emission of power, we have a re-emission of the electromagnetic wave. Therefore, it's a scattering process, we have an incoming electromagnetic wave, and this, uh, uh, this flux of energy is basically going to be distributed according to some angle. And we derived the, the cross-section of, our, of, our, uh, uh, of this sort of interaction. 
And again, I stressed n times the fact that when you think about the cross section of the Thompson scattering, this refers not to the size of the electron, the capability of the electron to absorb uh, a, a flux as a, as a ball would do, okay? But it expresses the, capa it expresses the, uh, the capability of the electron to absorb an incoming electromagnetic wave, which is given by the interaction of the electromagnetic wave and the electron itself, okay? It's an interaction way of thinking, okay? Then, what else we did? Then what we did uh, was also to, uh, we, uh, we used, uh, we, we went through an astrophysical application and we looked for the Eggdington luminosity. In which we considered a source of radiation, which might be a star. The star is emitting radiation. Let's say that it's surrounded by a cloud uh, which is uh, ionized. Therefore, there are three electrons. But there are also, since the medium is ionized, there are maybe also ions, therefore positive charges. What's going to happen? We know through this guy there is a momentum transfer because there is an energy momentum transfer which is given by the other components of the energy momentum tensor that are basically pushing the, uh, in, uh, that are basically going to push the charged particles away. For if I just get a small portion here, let's make a zoom. We have our electrons, we have our ions. Both the field is pressure, but they are free, therefore they are interacting through the uh, Thompson cross section. But the Thompson cross section of our ion, sigma uh, plus, is much smaller with respect to the one of the electron. That's because there is an inver is inversionally proportional to the square of the mass of the particle. But again, you see how this is related to the Lorentz force that is applied to the free electron. Because the force is directly proportional to the mass. And if you have a particle, the same force applied to a particle which is much more massive, an ion, then the acceleration is going to be slower. What does it mean? Slower acceleration, you understand, less emission. The electron is lighter for the same amount of force, tu, 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 is accelerating a lot, a lot of emitted power, okay? And therefore the cross section is much, more, is much larger. So what's happening in this scenario is not that the, that the, uh, that the, the, that the, um, that the two are uh, drawing. Uh, so what you would might think now is that if you have an ion, uh, sorry, an electron and uh, a uh, proton, this has a huge cross section. Therefore, it's going to interact a lot with the radiation and it's going to fly away because the cross section of the ion, let's put it here, is much smaller and they should drift apart. But that's not the case because they feel the feel, the Coulomb force between the two of them because one is charged positive, the other one is charged negative, and therefore, they kind of stick together. Therefore, the, the view that I gave you is like to think at a sailing boat in which you have the electron with the large cross section that capture the wind, that capture the, the momentum flux of the incoming radiation. We have the ion, which is massive, which is the ship itself underneath in the water, okay? That keeps, that, that carries the inertial acceleration of the, of the plasma outside, okay? So whenever you look at the acceleration of, the, of a portion of a plasma outside, the mass that is accelerated is dominated by the one of the, of the ion below. And then we have the Coulomb interaction, which link the electron and the ion and keeps them together. And this works not only for individual particles, but also for cloud of particles, because if we take a cloud of electrons, we take a cloud of ions, as soon as there is a, a little bit of drift, 
you see that we have more charged particles on this side, le more electric particles on this side, and therefore the Coulomb force tend to keep them together. Okay? So it, it, it works particle by particle, but you can also consider it as an ensemble, working on the ensemble of particles. Then we studied, furthermore, we, we moved on and we, we studied uh, synchrotron radiation. in which we have three electrons that are moving in a magnetic field. We know that such a, the trajectory of such an electron, again, there is the Lorentz force applied to our charged particle. The Lorentz force, we have only have the magnetic field. There is only the magnetic field, and our particle is going to basically create circular orbit if we are sitting in the orbit plane, where this is D, our electron is doing three trajectories. Uh, sorry, can somebody, uh, and we need to check your, uh, thank you. So it's going to basically orbit around the barycenter. If we look from uh, any other perspective, the actual trajectory of the electron looks like this because it can also drift in some direction. This is the trajectory and the direction of the, sorry, of the, the magnetic field. And uh, again, acceleration, which is centripetal. So again, with the absolute value of the velocity of this electron, of the orbital velocity of this electron is constant, but it's changing direction. And therefore, there is an acceleration. It enters in the Lorentz, in the, in the Larmor formula. And therefore, we have the emission. We measure the emission from, this, uh, from such an electron. That we have seen, we consider relativistic electrons, which give us very strong beaming. And basically, the majority of the radiation emitted by such an electron, actually more than half of the radiation, is uh, falls within an angle that I don't remember which, what, uh, which variable I used, but let's call it theta, which was roughly a gamma to the minus one. So it's very small. It's a very small angle. Therefore, the only radiation that, we, that is really relevant is not if I'm observing this electron from this direction, I basically see no flux. But if I'm in the plane of the orbit of, our, um, of the electrons, I see a lot of flux. Because basically, I'm the electron. Let's say that the magnetic field is pointing upward. I am moving in this moment in your direction, beaming. So all the radiation that I'm emitting is pointing in your direction. You see me. You don't see me. And then again, you see me, and you don't see me, and so on. So what you perceive is our super fast flashes. That transformed in the Fourier space give us a very broad spectrum. Okay, so the, such a radiation covers a very large range of, uh, uh, of frequencies. If we take the emission from uh, the free electrons in an AGN, we are basically, we can see these, the jets that are produced by these gigantic uh, black holes that are sitting in the core of these, of these uh, big galaxies ranging from the uh, microwaves, from the, sorry, from the radio, from the far radio, in the optical, which is a, a huge span in frequency. Then we moved on, and uh, what we also look at is another very important uh, configuration, which is created by uh, uh, basically plasmas, very hot plasmas, and that the, and the radiation produced by such plasmas is given by Bremsstrahlung emission. In which we have a plasma with a lot of free electron. We have a lot of ions. 
we study the interaction between one ion, which has a charge plus, an incoming uh, electron with some uh, initial velocity, and then we study the trajectory that is given by the Coulomb interaction, the Coulomb force between the two. We have an acceleration. Once more, Larmor, and we get the power emitted by this one electron. Then what we did, we studied the interaction of more electrons with more ions, and we arrive at the final spectrum of the Bremsstrahlung emission, in which we have seen that uh, one individual interaction will give a, a very large, a large uh, um, spectral coverage, and then the cutoff at high frequencies is given by the thermal distribution, by the thermal properties of uh, our uh, plasma. And the typical exponential cutoff that we have is an imprint of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. That tells us what is the distribution of the velocities of the particles in our plasma. Okay? The orbit depends on the velocity. We look what is the number of particles that have a certain velocity in our plasma. We assumed, we assumed a thermal plasma, Maxwell and Boltzmann distribution to describe the distribution of the velocities, and we got this exponential truncation in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the spectrum of our Bremsstrahlung radiation. Then we continued, and up to this point, we consider radiation uh, in a classical sense composed by electromagnetic wave. And what we further did is to move from light as an electromagnetic wave to a completely different prescription, to a different way of thinking at light as a, a stream of photons. many, many photons. Okay? I characterized the, the main properties of, this of, the, of the photons. Again, amazing results just from the very first line, where we have seen that photons are those particles that are traveling in the space-time diagram along the surface of the light cone. For if we are here, we can only observe photons that are traveling on our back cone up to the time that they hit us, okay? If we are emitting radiation, they can only be, this radiation can only be seen by some other observer that is sitting this, uh, uh, along the future light cone. So at a certain point in the future, this uh, object is going to be, uh, receive the radiation that we emitted at, this, at the origin here. Okay? Because photons, as I said, are moving along the, the diagonal. Other amazing consequence, still from this, uh, from this, uh, um, from, 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 from just this simple consideration, is the fact that photons must have a particle with zero mass. And in general, all particles that are traveling along the light cone with a velocity v, which is equal to c must be massless. And this is a very simple consideration by the Picomics for the fact that tau, the tau, is not defined on the light cone. And therefore, we cannot define a form momentum. Because we have the four velocity, that relates to the four velocity and therefore the four momentum, in which u mu is equal to the x mu over the tau. And this guy here is equal to zero. The tau is equal to zero. Therefore, this is not defined. And m u mu need, requires the mass to be equal to zero to have, to have it defined. Okay? Now that we 
got to learn about photons. We moved on and uh, we study the interaction once more, not within an electromagnetic wave which are composed by more photons with one free particle, or with one free electron. But again, we kept our free electron moving in some uh, direction. Let's say it's coming with some velocity uh, like that with one photon, with one incoming photon, one. We have a scattering process yes, uh, going on then for the momentum of our uh, electron, the prime can be changed, as well as the momentum of the outgoing photons can be changed. And we have seen that the change in the momentum of the particle is related to the frequency of the particle. Therefore, we have, a, in, in general, we have an energy momentum exchange of this particle because what is going to be conserved, again, is the energy momentum of our system. Of the full system. And by looking at the energy momentum conservation of the full system, we have our four equations for the energy and for the momentum. And at the end, we computed the change of frequency We computed the average from all possible direction whenever we have more photons. And then we also made the, 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 the we also computed the, the average. I don't know how to do it. Let's do it uh, like this. For all possible polarization angle of our incoming radiation when we consider unpolarized light. And after all, we derived as well the Thompson cross section. Nice to have it at this point. And then the last thing that we've seen, we consider quantum gases. So not only one photons, but a lot of photons. And we study the energy distribution of uh, uh, the spectral distribution of uh, uh, the photons of such a gas photons when it is in thermal equilibrium. And we arrive at the black body radiation. for what we did, we study a quantum gases in general. We have seen that since we are dealing with a quantistic object, the energy, sorry, the momentum, the phase space, phase space must be quantized. The phase space, I, I remind you, it's a, uh, is a, it, it belongs to four dimensions, uh, sorry, six dimensions space and momentum. So it tells you where the particles are and how they are moving. And if we take, for example, uh, one slice in the, in, the phase space, uh, uh, in the phase space, like position and momentum x, for example, or could be momentum y or whatever, I'm just taking a, a one slice across the six dimensional space for graphical reasons. If I have a number of particles here, I, I'm interested in the number density of particles that are sitting here, which are, which are the particles at this specific position that are moving in the y direction with this specific momentum. Okay? That's what it's telling you. Where the particles are and uh, with which velocity they are moving and where, because we have the three dimension for the, for the velocity as well. Then to know how many particles can sit in one of the cells, if I have a volume h to the power of three, uh, we uh, basically, you have to consider the fact if uh, particles obey or not to the um, uh, Pauli's exclusion principle, because if we are dealing with uh, fermions, 
we can only have uh, as an occupation number, so the number of particles that can sit in one cell, in one of the states, can be only or zero or one. Or there is a particle, or there is not, with that quantum state. If we are considering bosons, these are, for example, electrons. If we are considering bosons, then there are no limits. One, two, three, zero, et cetera, et cetera. And for example, we have photons, which are the ones that we care about. Then we counted how many particles can sit in one cell, given the fact that uh, photons do not obey the uh, exclusion principle of Pauli. And we derived the Planck spectrum. Assuming that is coming out from thermal equilibrium. That allowed us to use the grand canonical partition sum. Okay? Therefore, we had that the cell this has to be quantized because of the Heisenberg indetermination principle. Pauli exclusion principle to see how many particles can sit. Grand canonical ensemble because we are dealing with a, a, a thermal equilibrium particle. Uh, a thermal equilibrium, a, th a system in thermal equilibrium, and we derive the Planck spectrum. So that's basically on these two blackboard, it roughly what we did. Uh, I hope I didn't forget anything, what we did so far. Ah, back reaction, I forgot. That it ends, it enters at the end of uh, electrodynamics. When I studied electrodynamics, I, I told you it's a linear theory. It's incomplete because there is, we neglect the interaction uh, between uh, particles and electromagnetic field. There is not the back reaction. That then we patched by just uh, uh, computing an effective force that is necessary because, uh, and is natural in the system, because otherwise we would have, for example, a, an infinitely emitting uh, uh, synchrotron radiation. We have a magnetic field. Our particle is spinning constantly. There is no force that slows the particles down and therefore can radiate forever, which cannot be, which is not. We introduced our effective force and then we see that actually our electron is slowing down. It's radiating, it's losing energy. The energy that this guy is possessing is the kinetic energy. Therefore, it's giving its kinetic energy to radiation, to energy that is going out, and it slows down. This is was also one of the killers of the Bohr atom, because and a push and gave a strong push to uh, quantum mechanics, because the atom could have not be anymore intended as a, 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 a nucleus, a positive nucleus. Uh, our electron, which is negative, spinning around it because it's losing radiation, and the time scale which that, uh, that uh, involve this process is so small that the atom is uh, stable. Basically, it, the electron would spiral down and collide with the ion at the center. We wouldn't uh, exist, but we do. Okay? Therefore, that uh, source of model, this kind of model for our atom had to be trashed away. We had to substitute our charged particle that is spinning around the ion with something which is unlocalized, uh, such as quantum uh, particle and therefore. Uh, uh, utilize the the the, the 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 wave function associated to particles instead of thinking at them as 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 uh, as individual points. Okay. Good. So we can have a, a break. Perhaps it's going to be we can make it a little bit shorter. So ten minutes. 
we can meet uh, Reconvey at 10:20 uh, because I'm going to show you nice slides in which we have uh, applications of astrophysics and uh, pretty pictures. Okay, so it will be going to be a little bit relaxing to chill down. Okay, in 10 minutes then. <laughs>